What do you want? I'm in the middle of a podcast. Leave me alone. This guy who really is, I think, a bad guy. Russell, I think you are a bad guy. I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what the truth. I don't want him knowing where I live. You can hate Russell, you Russell, but one thing you cannot take from Russell is his ability to play that game. I ain't finished playing just yet. Welcome to the Russell Hunt Show. We've been doing this show for a few months now. And I've been having a lot of fun talking about reality TV. My goal has been just to entertain you as you go about your day. Be it while you're working out at the gym, getting ready for the morning, or driving to work. Wherever you listen. That's why I do it. I love doing this show. And 99% of the time, the stuff we talk about, really, if you think about it, means little in the big scheme of things. It's entertainment, and it's important, yes. It serves a purpose, and I'm proud to be a part of it. But sometimes there are things that happen, like what happened last week in Vegas, that makes you stop and think about life and how fragile it can be. Today, I am proud to say we bring a family member, not a real family member, but a family member from reality TV community, Brittany Martinez from Big Brother 16. Brittany was at the Harvest 91 Festival in Vegas. She was right in the middle of the shooting, and thank God she made it out of there. She came on the show, and we chatted about her horrible experience. Here's Brittany. Today has been kind of like riding out the waves as I've been the past few days. Today was a little easier than the past few days that I've had, but I'm okay right now. I feel like in the in the morning is usually when it's toughest, which I would feel like normally it would be at night, considering the the whole incident and everything right. happened at night. But um, I'm okay right now. You yeah. caught me at a good time. And you, you you know, a lot of people are interviewing the, the ones that actually were wounded at that event. And the thing is, I think the every single person that was there were were wounded because you physically have someone shooting at you. So that is a, I mean, you're not a soldier. You're not, it's not something that you're trained for. It's, you know, you're just having a good time at an event. And then all of a sudden you have a terrorist act occurring. And I don't, you know, I want to get to it uh, a little later, uh, talking about exactly uh, how you felt at that time. But I just want to start off uh, how you, uh, do you live in Vegas? Is that why you were there or how did you attend that event? No, I live in Southern California, which is interesting. Cause I want to say there was a large percentage of Southern Californians there. Um, even one of the girls that ended up passing away was a senior at my daughter's high school. Wow. I had probably over 50 friends that were there that were all from Southern California. Yeah. So um, we just went there. It's, it's a four and a half hour drive for us. That's not far at all. And we've always been country fans and mm-hmm. you have the best of both worlds with country music and, you know, Vegas is like an adult Disneyland. So right. it, it was my first time and we were just super fired up and excited and yeah. So when you, when you got there, did you go with a group of friends there were eight of us total, eight girls total, and um, our wristbands, we had originally bought general admission wristbands, and um, we ended up being given the VIP, which is the front of the stage. So we spent the first three days at the front of the stage in the heart of all of it. And towards the end, one of my girlfriends was really hungry, and she wanted to go off and grab, like, nachos. So we were going to kind of separate and split up. So one of us had decided, you know what, we've been here the whole time. It's our last night. We're all going together. So as we were walking to grab a bite for the first time, we had not ate in all three days during that concert. And for the first time, all eight of us went together to go grab a bite to eat. And that's when the shooting had started. Wow. Were y'all, uh, where were you uh, in proximity of in the uh, watching the concert? Were you in the front? I'm trying to get a view of because the shooter were, was behind you, right? In the uh a uh, high story. Correct. He was behind you. Correct. So were you in front of the concert or uh, backward or further than the back? So we were further to the back because we were on our way to the food courts and the food stations to grab food. 
So when the shooting occurred, we were all excited, like thinking, oh, there's fireworks. So we're all looking around to see the fireworks. And people are kind of iffy. Some people are screaming gunshots. And some people are screaming, it's fireworks, relax, you know. But when everybody in body started scattering and running like cockroaches, I mean, we went into a panic. And there happened to be military that was around us. So these two military guys grabbed some of the girls and a cop grabbed me and he wasn't in uniform. He was an off duty cop and he grabbed me and just started running with me. And honestly, a lot of those parts became very gray for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't even know how I went from the concert to Tropicana. Like that part I have no memory of. I just remember running and all of a sudden I was in a hotel. Okay. So he ran you out towards the hotel and that's where everybody was running as they as he was shooting yeah i mean everybody was running different directions because for us at the moment we didn't know where the shooter was or we all thought he was on foot so we're all trying to hide in cubbies and under Mm -hmm. tables and chairs and we think that he's on foot at the moment and i mean we're shocked we don't know what to expect and you know everybody's been drinking all day long and so um this guy just grabbed me and said, listen, like I'm keeping you safe. I'm a cop and runs with me and I'm with him and some of his group of friends, I'm assuming, but that's when I got separated from all seven of the other girls. So I'm with this complete stranger. And then we end up at Tropicana, um, which from there, um, as we're at Tropicana, I'm making phone calls to try to get in touch with my family. But at this point it's late. So my kids are already sleeping. I can't call them. So I call my dad, and as I'm on the phone with my dad, people start freaking out inside Tropicana and running every direction, oh, saying, no. there's a shooter, there's a shooter. So I get underneath the chair from, like, in the casino, one of the gambling chairs. I get under the chair, and I call my dad, and I just tell him, I love you, and I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. Like, wow. check the news, check the news. So I would hate to be, as a parent, the other person accepting that phone call as a parent, you know? Right. Yeah, I hear um, So when you was so, when so when y'all were in there, uh, it was chaos everywhere. Y'all y'all thought maybe he was on foot, and now he's you, in your mind he's in the Tropicana, and he's shooting in there as well. So I, me as a father, and I know I seen pictures of your beautiful family, and I and I know that your kids had to be going through your head because for me. I would immediately, that's all I would be thinking about is my children. And I think that would be the most effective. It, it, that would affect me more than anything because of that. And, you, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that if, if they're shooting, somebody's shooting, my first thought would be to find them and try to get them. But in this case, I, nobody could find him or get to them. When did y'all realize that, did, did you ever realize at any point that the shooter is from above? Never. I, I never did. And those were the same emotions and the only thing going through my head. And I looked at the stranger that was next to me and said, I have to get through this because I have to get back to my babies. Like, mm-hmm. that's the only thing that I could possibly think of. That was the only thing in my mind was getting back to my kids. And he just said, take a deep breath. Like, you're going to be fine. You're, you're going to get through this. And from that point on, we ended up in, like, this big um, banquet room that Tropicana has security and everybody. I mean, SWAT team, there's guns everywhere. And I feel like at the moment, you, you couldn't even process everything that you were seeing and going through. It's, it's almost like you were numb. And I, I still do at times feel kind of numb. But then I break out crying for hours at times. And not even knowing, like, what's triggering that emotion or what I'm crying about. I, I couldn't even tell you what I'm crying about, you know. It's just, I'm just kind of rolling with the waves of it. Right. When I'm assuming that the shooter was not aiming. I'm assuming that he, he, he was just just all over the place. So it didn't matter where you were at that time. If he could see you from the window or with whatever he was shooting, he was just like spraying whatever he could so i think he was shooting as quickly as he could possibly shoot because he was 
he was not aiming at the artist at the stage, I don't think. No, no, because the stage was actually how, where he was at and aiming down from Mandalay Bay, the stage was towards his back. So he was basically getting everybody in the crowd. Oh, and I see. the stage was not even his focus at all. Oh, okay. So he, so if he's looking for Mandalay Bay, he's looking at the stage. He's looking behind the stage? Or? the back of the stage. Correct. He's, he sees Correct. behind the stage. So he just sees above. He sees the big crowd. Yeah, so he's basically shooting over the stage towards everyone else. Right. Did you know that they had some uh, some new data on this guy that was planning to go to Chicago and Fenway Park? He was going to try to find hotels that were high enough to where he could actually shoot into Fenway Park. I did not know that. I yes. mean, I spend, I've probably slept maybe an hour and a half each night if I'm lucky. So... I find myself on my phone constantly and trying to find more information and trying to understand everything, right. you know, what his purpose was or have you been watching have you been watching the news? I've I've been watching the news, um, but mainly I'm also watching a lot on social media of what people are posting and it's interesting because I swore that somebody was shooting inside Tropicana. Mm -hmm. And everybody kept saying, no, it was one shooter, it was one shooter. So when we were sequestered for a few hours at Tropicana in the banquet room, um, I was explaining to a friend that I actually ran into from my hometown back here in Torrance that I ran into there as I was by myself. And he had said, no, Brett, you know, um, there was only one shooter and they caught him. He was shooting from Mandalay Bay. But now watching social media and everybody's stories and their videos, it sounds like there were multiple shooters. Mm -hmm. That's and very at interesting. Because the they are yeah, saying the they time, possibly had two shooters. At least. And I swear, I mean, a vivid memory that I have that's the most vivid is in Tropicana when everybody was trampling over everybody. Because all I could think was, if we're not going to get shot and killed by, you know, this guy that's shooting us, somebody's going to die because of everybody trampling over each other. Mm -hmm. It was like something from a movie. It, everybody was just trying to, you know, save themselves. And I mean, aside from at the concert venue, it was incredible to see how everyone came together to risk their own lives to save others. But in a panic for all of us to run from the concert into a hotel that wasn't at the concert, there's a lot of people that don't know what's going on and they're scattering everywhere, freaking out itself. So I wasn't sure if the shooter had came into Tropicana or if I was just still hearing the gunfires from the concert. So it sounded like gunfire was that loud inside Tropicana? Yeah, I could hear it from Tropicana where I was at and people were screaming, we have a shooter, he's shooting. And everybody was running different directions. So you really didn't know which direction to run or who to trust. I mean, you know, there's all these cops and then the, the SWAT team and right. people with rifles just everywhere and everybody running through there with, I mean, bloody from head to toe and just, mm. it was horrible. Absolutely it, terrible. So it seems like to me when something like that happens, you, you can't, because people are trained uh, to deal with this type of thing. The SWAT teams, they're, they can train to stay focused and be able to do their job under that kind of uh, stress. Normal people aren't trained to stay focused. So <clears throat> it's easy to get out of focus, I'm sure. And then your mind just races, I'm sure. I mean, could you even think straight? It's it's hard for me to believe that that would be no, possible. I, I I couldn't. And that's what I'm saying. I, it was almost like I went through, like I had amnesia. And I was just, somebody was talking to me and I would see, I would see, them talking to me, but I couldn't even process or register anything they were saying. And when I made the phone call to my father, he couldn't even make out what I was saying. And then finally, about 15 minutes after that phone call, it was popping up on the news everywhere. Mm, yeah. So my daughter was doing her homework and she was up late and then she was getting messages like, is your mom okay? This and that. So she goes on social media and wakes up her dad and is freaking out because that's how she woke up to wondering if her mom's okay because there's a shooting in Vegas. Right. 
Yet, so so some of the people that were shot were running into the into Tropicana. Some of the victims that think, actually were shot. No, I I think most of the victims that were shot were actually towards the front of the stage. Right. Because it, it was open grounds. I mean, there's nowhere that you can hide, and that's why everybody basically dropped to the ground and hovered over each other because they were scared if they stood up. You know, in their minds, I, I can't speak for them, but in their minds, I'm sure everybody was thinking that he was on foot because that's exactly what was going through my head. Like, that's right. why people were hiding in freezers and everything else wow. where you can't be seen. That's terrible. What What happened in Tropicana when... When did things calm down? Like, how long a process was this? In your mind, in your mind, how long was this happening? It felt like for hours, but it was only, I want to say, I guess he was shooting for, for seven to ten minutes. Um, but for me, in my mind, it felt it felt like hours. It felt never-ending. Wow. And then by the time after we were sequestered, um, I want to say it was about five in the morning, that we could come out, but we still couldn't get back to our room because we're staying next to Mandalay Bay. We're staying at Delano, which was attached to Mandalay. Right. So y'all so had to get... we never got back into our hotel. So they sequestered everyone that was in the everyone area? Everyone at different hotels. Everyone, they sequestered at different hotels. So um, it... Excalibur, half of my group was sequestered at Excalibur. A lot were sequestered in Hooters. A lot were sequestered in Tropicana. I heard some were sequestered in MGM. I mean, basically the whole strip was dead. Nobody right. was walking around. So you got like separated. You got separated from your group. Did you know that they were okay? I did because thankfully we all had our phones. So okay. we were able to communicate through our phones and touch base and they were safe. And you say they you were sequestered for, till five o'clock in the morning because this happened at ten o'clock that after, that night, ten o eight p.m. Yeah. yeah. And it happened I for about fifteen that... minutes, fifteen twenty minutes, and then it had to be a little chaotic after. Even when the killer uh, reportedly uh, shot himself, uh, it had to have still been chaos. Oh, it, it was chaos for sure. I mean, ambulances. I, I've i never seen so many ambulances going down the street. There was at least probably two dozen. Lights everywhere, cops everywhere, people running everywhere. Um, so the streets were, were shut down. But, yeah, it was complete chaos. And then after being sequestered, we were able to walk to the other nearest hotels if you were staying at the other nearest hotels. Mm -hmm. But for us, we had to walk to Hooters because we couldn't get to ours. So right. then we ended up being sequestered at Hooters until Delano would let us in, which didn't end up being until about 11 o'clock in the morning the next day. When they let y'all in, did they frisk everyone? Did they do anything like that? No, they didn't do anything like that. It was just... It was a complete ghost town and everyone in shock. Even the following day, we tried to get food before we drove home. We ended up driving there. Everything was completely shut down. I've never seen this strip like that. I mean, the strip was shut down, the restaurants, nobody was working. It was your, like, first off hotel staff, and that was all you saw there for miles to come. Yeah, and with this guy, you know, people. some people are trying to make it political. And uh, that's what happens in these kind of disasters. Uh, two different sides start fighting over this and that. Or was he Democrat? Was he Republican? I disagree with that because this is a tragedy that needs to be fixed. It has to be fixed however we can. And we have to do it together, not as Democrat or not as Republican. And I agree. I, I feel like it doesn't, to me personally, it, it doesn't matter at all whether it was a terrorist attack or, you know, a guy that lost his mind went through a breakup. Like, I don't care what it was. Either way, it's affected all of us in so many lives, and it, uh, that shouldn't be the main focus at all. No, I agree. And it, it, they're talking to the – it's crazy. They are saying – I'm hearing a lot of things about it. there being two shooters, and I'm just saying what I'm hearing. I don't know if that's the case, but – I wanted to talk about that before you even said that you thought maybe there was two shooters because that's what you thought as you were, it was happening. 
correct? Yeah, that's that's definitely what I thought. And that was before I even started reading any of this other stuff. So there's a lot of pages and separate, like, you know, accounts on Facebook and stuff for people that are actually victims that had witnessed it and survived. And, and um, so it's interesting comparing stories and then seeing videos that you see. And I think that's what's ca- caught my attention. I'm trying to figure out and put the pieces together as well. Was there another shooter or... You know, I mean, everything happens so quickly for us that we couldn't process it at all to to even figure out where the shooter was coming from, if he was coming from up above at Mandalay or if he was on ground. And so um, definitely, I don't know, it's interesting, especially with the information that they have as far as like him ordering food for two people and this and that. And I don't understand why he had two different windows blown out. Right. I mean, to take the time to run from one window to another window. Yeah, they should be able to somehow, I don't know, because they didn't have any video. Did they have any video of him actually shooting from the window? I don't know even, I haven't seen that Um, video, if they have that. I think think all you could see was the gunfire itself coming from Mandalay, but they don't have any actual footage of seeing him shooting from the window, from what I've seen. You see, I, I don't know what's... You know, if this was a terrorist attack, I don't really care one way or the other. I just think it's a tragedy. Uh, and I, his his um, girlfriend was saying that he that she thought he was going crazy, that he was having night terrors, and he would scream in the middle of the night. So I don't know if this was mental illness. I don't, you know, it's just nobody knows nothing right now about this guy. I didn't, but I mean, as far as like details like that, I don't even know if we ever will know the truth behind that. You know, I think the most important part is wondering, is there another guy out there that's going to turn around and repeat the same thing? Or if there was, if if there was a second shooter, we need to know that immediately and find out who it is and get that person. That's my biggest thing. Right. Right. Yeah, because it's impossible to stop this from happening. It's it's going to happen. And and the thing is, this at this moment, you're right. The best thing we could do at this moment is find out if there was a second shooter, because if there was, we need him. And that's that's the yeah. only thing we could do right now with this. And you know, another another thing, people are talking about guns, this and that, talking about should they take away guns? Should they, you know, there there you go again with the politics. It takes, you know, in this nation, terrorists killed over two thousand people with box cutters and an airplane. So if someone has a wheel, they will find a way. So we need to fix that. You know, we need to, I don't know the solution. I really can't, I really can't tell you the solution because I have no clue how to fix it. And I'm glad I'm not one of the ones in politics that has to try to find out how to fix it. I just know it's a tragedy. Yeah. Because I heard, I heard you, I heard you in an interview. I heard your voice and I recognized your voice. And I was like, wait. And I started listening to it, and I, figured, and I found out it was you. And I, I, I couldn't believe that that someone so close could be in that kind of tragedy. You know, someone in our Big Brother and Survivor and all that, or reality TV family. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to us. It can happen to my children. And, you know, we don't supposed to be afraid. They don't, they say, they say, if you're afraid, if you give in, then... They win. Evil wins. But the problem is, I am afraid of my children. I'm not afraid what's going to happen to me. When I do, when I do uh, like uh, festivals with my kids, I don't walk in the street because of what can happen. I make them walk on the sidewalks because of things that can happen. So it's not because I am afraid. I'm afraid of my something happening to my children. I can't. How how can you not be? I'm not afraid of something that can happen to me. I can deal with it. But my children, I can't deal with that, you know? No, I agree completely. So, you know, it's, uh, it makes you weary to want to go do things. I mean, are you going to want to go to a concert, you know, an open venue concert or even a closed venue concert? Because it just happened to, uh, the, um, the other thing that happened. I mean, does it make you afraid the way you can't do it? You can't 
do these things anymore? Are you going to be strong enough? I, what well, are you going through with that? I mean, it definitely, even seeing, you know, Frankie's sister, Ariana Grande, if mm-hmm. I go through what she had went through, I instantly, yeah, you become fearful. It's, it's kind of like a natural human reaction. You just, you get scared, you know, whether, whether you want to or not. And I know we're supposed to keep going on with our lives so that they don't win. But naturally, you are fearful. Right. But experiencing it, I mean, it's, it's hard. I, I feel like right now we're still going through the waves. And like I said, there's times that I'm kind of numb towards it and I'm okay. And then there's times that I'm breaking down and nothing. Like when I drop my kids off every day, for some reason, it's the hardest right. part throughout my day is dropping them off at school. Well, that's understandable. So, yeah, and, and there's emotions that I, I don't even know why I'm crying or am I crying because I'm dropping them off at school and I can't be with them. But I, I can't even tell you that's the reason. I'm just instantly just, and I, I go through that probably 15 times a day. And the girls that were with me are my very close friends. And we have a group chat going to express our emotions and to feel normal and understand that like it's, it's normal and that's what we're all going through. And we just don't know how to process it right now. I, I feel like right now it's still kind of like a dream and we don't have any of the answers for it. Right. You know? Yeah. That's, it's crazy. Like it's hard for me to even comprehend if I would have went through something like that, you know, because you, you start thinking I'm not a selfish guy. So I'm thinking of my children. So, you know, if something happened to me, what would happen to them, you know? And uh, so I, w- I was wondering when they sequestered you guys, what was that for? And what questions did they ask you guys? Did they, did they do that to find out if, if they had a terrorist among the people? Um, they sequestered us, I'm assuming. I mean, we weren't asking questions, but I'm assuming because they were trying to make sure the gunman was down or there wasn't another active shooter. I mean, I personally don't know either because if they caught the shooter, I don't know exactly why everybody was being sequestered, but maybe they had doubt that there was another right. shooter themselves. Because that's a long time to be sequestered because it w- if it was uh, basically it was 8 or 10.08 when it happened, happened for approximately 15 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, they found him within 45 minutes he was dead. So before 11 o'clock, he was dead, and y'all stayed sequestered till 5 o'clock in the morning. So I'm wondering if they thought, if they thought that there was a second shooter or they were trying to find out, because if you gather everybody together, if one of the shooters happened to run in there you know, uh, and was amongst you guys, then they would have to uh, start asking questions. That's why I was wondering what questions did they ask you? Did they ask you anything like uh, where you're from and that kind of thing? No. I mean, nobody really talked about anything because I think everybody was still in shock and the cops were doing their job and, you know, the firefighters doing their job and news I at that point. I, I can't tell you, but I'm sure news was just basically trying to focus on capturing images and stuff and getting their stories later. Yeah. Did you get a chance to thank that guy that, that grabbed you? Because you said you was you had almost feel like you have amnesia. Do you think if he wasn't there that you would have been frozen in your steps? I very much so probably would have. Because at that point, I don't even know how my girlfriends and I got separated and I think we were just all standing around together and kind of like in shock, like what's going on? Do we believe it's a shooter or a fireman or what? And then he starts running and grabs me. And I don't know if maybe he thought I was separated from my girlfriends or what, but I, I didn't question anything. All I thought to do was I'm running just to be safe, you know, which I now look back and then I'm sad. I mean, why why was I safe and I was further away from the stage and I wasn't helping anybody else, you know? But at the right. time, I guess you're just, you go into panic and you just run. Yeah, you can't feel like that. It's impossible to to second guess yourself. I mean, just, just be thankful your children wasn't with you. Just think what would be going through your mind if your children were standing next to you. That's what I thought of a thousand times because there were right. so many kids at the family concert, you know? It's not like something you don't take your kids to. It's a family concert oh. that you celebrate with your family and you have a great time and it's 
yeah, it, it's terrible because we saw so many kids there. And then when you watch mm. the videos, there's so many kids running with their parents or grandparents. And the lady that was sitting next to me in Tropicana had like a seven month old with her, wow. this little baby boy mm. and her daughter. And then her son was like three years old and her legs were completely scraped up and bloody and wow. terrible. And her husband's shirt was off and he was bloody. And I was talking to her and I'm like, I can't wow. even imagine having my kids there. And she just cried and said, I just wanted to save them. Like I just had to save them. Right. So she didn't care how many times she fell. She just kept on running, you know? And I think that was the only thing that all of us could think in that moment was just to run. That's terrible. Yeah. It's so just... I think it's amazing for the heroes that stopped and, you know, like <laughs> saved strangers or crawled over them and, yeah, you have you know, actually have heroes that were on top of the people that climbed on top of exactly, them. and that's that's our military. Those are cops off duty. And that's right. So when they hear crap all the time, you know, for cops this and that and blah blah blah, they're the ones that are trained to do that. And that night, that's all they were doing. There could have been that death toll, could have been way higher than what it is, but. All the people in these stories of the survivors that actually got through it and out of the hospital, most of them have a story of somebody that was in the army or served right. or was a cop so, or a uh, fireman. Yeah, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So while they were sitting over there, kneeling, taking a knee on that Sunday because of all that stupid, uh, whatever, you know, whatever they do, while they're taking a knee because of cops you have cops on top of people risking their life. So, um, you know, and that it's, it's just, I am, you know, uh, 100% on board with our troops and our cops. I think they're amazing off duty or on duty. And it showed, it showed that night. I agree. I mean, especially for all of us that witnessed it, 100%. And one of the guys, actually a few of the guys that were in our group, they're cops as well. And they were saving their wives and random people and seeing women, you know, a, a great friend of ours, like witnessed somebody, a young woman getting shot like in her neck and he was mm. helping her. I mean, they were just attending to everyone and they have families, they have wives, they have kids at home. And, and instantly they go into their mode of helping people. So I don't think it's fair if, a cop makes a mistake and then they're attacked for it. Right. Whatever. I mean, we're all human and we all make mistakes every single day. So just because they have a badge doesn't make them a terrible person or a horrible cop. That's right. There's bad apples in everything. Everything. Every race, every individual, there's, there's a bad seed. So right. it's not fair just to kind of <laughs> section them out. Well, Brittany, I, I, you know, it's, I was really, um, uh, it was really hard for me to even think about what I was going to talk about today because uh, I know or I can only imagine how rough it is and, and how fresh it is in your mind right now. But uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us. And, uh, you know, I hope that you can get past maybe, uh, you know, what's happened and move on forward with your beautiful, healthy children. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me on to share my story. Uh, we appreciate it, you know, and all I can say is, uh, you know, God bless and God bless the police officers and the, the heroes and the, the dads and the moms and whoever was out there trying to run in towards the crowd instead of away from the crowd to try to help people, you know, so we do have good people. I agree. You know, and, and I guarantee you, we it do. was Republican and Democrat running towards. It wasn't just a bunch of Republicans at a co uh, a country concert, like like some uh, mainstream media like to say. You know, we had both sides, all colors, uh, trying to help people. Whether they run into the crowd or whether they grabbing a child and running him into safety, or grabbing you and running you into safety. You know, they had. That, probably hundreds of heroes that, was that my day. Point. Yeah, exactly. That was my point. I mean, the guy that helped me was a Hispanic guy. And then there's an interview of this this colored man, you know, that's running and helping all these people that are there. Right. At, at that point, 
all of our blood is the same color That's right. and there were no color lines but we were all the same people so for everyone to come together i feel like it, it sucks that it takes such a tragic and a, a massacre itself for right. everyone to come together and put those walls down but i i think it's something that we all need to rethink and come together again because we don't know if this is going to be the end of it, but it's probably just the beginning of a lot of it, which is the scary thing to say, especially for us having kids. It's right. just getting worse. Yep. Sad, but probably true. Okay, Brittany, well, I appreciate you coming on the show. I really appreciate this, and I, and I want you to have a good day. Thank you. I appreciate it. You stay in touch. Okay, you too. Stay safe. Okay. All right, Brittany. Thank you. All right, thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, that was Brittany Martinez. I thank her from the bottom of my heart for coming on the show to share her story with us. We are blessed that she is still with us, and we mourn those that are fallen. And we thank all of the brave men and women who risk their lives to save the lives of others. For everyone out there in the reality TV community, even the people that I've gotten into arguments with in the years let me just say, you are my family, and I love and support you. And for everyone else that's listening, thank you and be safe. We'll be doing more Survivor shows coming soon. Finally, I don't have all the answers, but I do believe there is hope. And for the darkness the world can bring, I believe we can be better. There's a great exchange of dialogue at the end of True Detective Season 1. Woody Harrison says, it appears to me that the darkness has a lot more territory. And Matthew McConaughey says, you're looking at it wrong. Once there was only dark, you ask me, the light's winning. All right, guys, until next time, keep hope alive.